I think it's alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalatu salam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. My dear respected brothers and sisters, um, today inshallah ta'ala we have a um, special um, uh, episode in our um, live streaming uh, from Zoom. Um, it's going to be more about our health in Ramadan and uh, in general as well. Um, so inshallah ta'ala would like uh, everyone to join and benefit and uh, there'll be time inshallah ta'ala to ask questions. Um, as you know, uh, in uh, uh, Najashi, Emka, we've been uh, trying to get uh, ourselves involved in the community, uh, even though there's a lockdown, but we try to um, be part, inshallah ta'ala, of the community and uh, assist as much as we can. On the ground, we've been supporting um, locals with food parcels and uh, fresh uh, fruits and vegetables, hot meals. Uh, but also uh, on the social media, we've been trying to um, get in touch with everyone and communicate uh, our beautiful message of Islam um, and khair for, for, for everyone. Um, today, inshallah ta'ala, we have a special guest, uh, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Mohammed, uh, and we have uh, Dr. Kamal Ibrahim as well. Uh, so inshallah ta'ala, Dr. Kamal will be taking over and uh, he will be, inshallah ta'ala, uh, discussing with Dr. Mahmoud the, the, the health benefits uh, from Siam and so on. And there'll be time, inshallah ta'ala, for Q&A. And we'll put uh, numbers, inshallah ta'ala, that you can call with uh, the meeting ID and password. Uh, that will be put for you, inshallah ta'ala, once uh, the Q&A session starts, uh, for you to call, uh, if you'd like, um, and ask questions. But you can also use the comments to put any comment you'd like or questions, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, Dr. Kamal. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, so, uh, assalamu alaikum to all the, the, the audience. Uh, my name is Dr. Kamal Ibrahim. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the program and thank uh, Emka um, for having us. Uh, so. I'm representing Eritrea Health, which is an organization which is trying to empower um, the Eritrean community um, uh, in the UK and internationally through um, different mediums such as social media, YouTube videos and uh, Facebook uh, and other mediums to uh, educate themselves about health related issues. Uh, and uh, alhamdulillah, this has uh, been a project that we've started re recently and we're trying to do this through um, different channels and also through different languages um, uh, and, and connect with different generations within the Eritrean community. Uh, so uh, really thankful to uh, Abu Mu'adh and MCAP for having us um, uh, to be able to deliver a program uh, which would support um, the Muslim community specifically in this topic um, when we're looking at Ramadan. Um, so just before we go into the seminar, uh, in terms of where you can uh, find out a bit more about us, inshallah, uh, we are trying to use uh, YouTube as one of the main places where we're promoting uh, health for the Eritrean community. Um, so if you look for us on YouTube and type in Eritrea Health, inshallah, you'll be able to find our channel. And that's where you'll be able to find more content uh, in, the, in the different languages that we've started. And inshallah, we'll pr pr promote more. Uh, the last thing that I'd like to do before moving into the program, and thank you for being patient with us, um, is uh, to introduce a, um, a project which we will be trialing uh, and what I'll do is just um, share my screen so that this can be shared with everybody. Uh, and I'm going to do this now. Um, so bear with me. So I'm just going to share the screen. As you know, there's lots of uh, technical parts to doing this. So I'll just arrange. Okay, here we are. Okay, so what um, we um, noted with um, within Eritrea Health and the, the people who have been supporting is that we, as healthcare professionals, have been receiving calls from people who wanted to know a bit more or maybe confused about the UK-based guidelines on uh, COVID-19. Uh, so we decided to try and create a hotline 
which will be um, for anybody finding difficulty in English. Um, so Tigrinya and Arabic, um, just if anybody wanted to talk to a healthcare professional about symptoms or things that they're confused about. Uh, if you're very fluent and good at English, we would recommend using the 111 helpline, which is the UK based uh, government helpline. Um, to seek support, especially if you're quite unwell. Um, but if you want to general advice uh, and you find the English is very difficult, then we've got this helpline. Um, and we thankfully have been sponsored by Careful Aid. So we'd like to thank them for supporting us with this. Um, the number is here. And what we'll do is after the program, inshallah, um, we, can, we can share this as a post as well. Uh, and this is also on the Careful Aid um, COVID-19 project page. Uh, to find this number. The number will run uh, for one hour on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Um, so we encourage you um, to use it if you feel you have a family member, parents who find it difficult uh, communicating in English and they wanted to speak to somebody to, to get a bit of support. Okay, um, so that was all I wanted to discuss about um, the organization. So now, inshallah, I'll stop sharing there and I will move into introducing our guest. Um, so uh, I'm very delighted to, to invite a friend um, and colleague uh, uh, as, a, as a doctor, um, who is Dr. Mahmoud Mohammed. Uh, he studied at Imperial College London. He works as a general practitioner, a GP uh, in London, UK, and he has a special interest in dermatology. Uh, which is uh, the science, uh, the medical science uh, related to illnesses of the skin. Um, he studied a bachelor's, uh, in, in addition to, to qualifying medical school, he also studied a um, bachelor of science degree uh, in gastroenterology, where he did some research in, briefly into fasting and the impact of the body. So this is uh, a perfect type of seminar for him to go through. Uh, and so I'd like to, without keeping you waiting, introduce you uh, to the doctor and allow him to uh, go through his program and presentation. Uh, and after that, inshallah, I would like to invite uh, all of you to um, leave questions and answers. Um, the best place to do that will be in uh, leaving comments in the Facebook Live box. Alternatively, inshallah, when the question and answer time starts, we will leave a phone number if you wanted to call in and directly talk with the doctor and ask the question. We'll leave a phone number uh, with our meeting ID that you can use and a password to get in and, and speak to the doctor. Um, so I'll hand over to Dr. Mahmoud and um, I'll mute myself, inshallah. Jazakallah uh, khair for the generous introduction. Um, Kamal is a colleague of mine, as, as we said. Um, I appreciate the efforts he makes as well, mashallah, in that regard. Uh, so without further ado, uh, the talk today is regarding a fasting in Ramadan. Um, so what I would like to do is um, go through a few things once I've got my slides, uh, the slideshow active. Uh, so bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa ala rasulullah. So, Thanks once again for the opportunity to Emka and uh, Dr. Kamal for organizing things uh, and Abu Ma'ad. So, okay, so the topic is fasting and health. Um, so there's a few questions that I sort of asked myself uh, when I was present preparing this to try and make it as beneficial as possible. Uh, the aim is to try and keep things simple and inshallah, make sure that we all take away something. And I remind myself of certain things that I should be doing as well in that regard. Um, so I have a few key questions that I want to try and answer uh, for you all that I think will be very useful. Number one, what happens to the body when you're fasting? Uh, number two is what are the benefits of fasting? Um, and this is more, again, more the health related benefits, as opposed to we know a lot of the Islamic benefits and the spiritual benefits in that regard. So this is a, 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 in addition to that, we're focusing on the health benefits today. Uh, I asked myself the question is, can fasting harm you? Uh, and we sort of what I wanted to look at ways in which fasting can actually be harmful from a health perspective, again, uh, rather than a spiritual perspective. And then uh, I wanted to discuss some common scenarios uh, and I, I put there just to remind myself, 
and yourself that fasting is a good opportunity to, to give up on, on bad habits. Uh, so carrying on, uh, the body essentially, when it, comes to when it comes to food, the body has two states essentially. Number one is the fasting state. And number two is the fed state. I'm keeping it very simple. So one situation is you eating and the other situation you're fasting. So these are two uh, scenarios that, that the body is going through from a, from a food perspective. In the, to be able to understand the impact of fasting, uh, I think it's very important to, to, to understand what's going on in this regard. So when we are fed and we're eating normally uh, throughout the day, our body is producing a hormone called insulin. Now, we may have heard of insulin when it comes to diabetes and how some people need more insulin. And that's why in diabetes, they're injecting themselves with insulin. Now, the body has its own natural hormone called insulin anyway. And this hormone is secreted into the blood at a high level when we're eating because we need the insulin essentially to break down the foods and um, make sure that we are processing the food. So when, when you've had a meal, you've had a burger or, or whatever you've eaten, uh, all of what the, it gets, you know, your bloodstream essentially gets a slight rise in its sugar level. And then your body becomes aware that there is more nutrients in the bloodstream. And so insulin is secreted. Now, this insulin helps to break down the food and organize it. Um, so it breaks down certain foods into sugars, simple sugars. And sugars are like uh, the petrol, essentially, of the body. It's the energy currency of the body, glucose. And it breaks it down to really uh, that energy component. And it gives you the energy. And you might feel a bit more energized after we break our fast, for example, when we've had food. It's because of all of that glucose that's been uh, broken down by the insulin uh, from the food. And it's rushing around in our bloodstream. The second thing that happens uh, when you're eating uh, and with the insulin is that um, essentially when there's too much, usually there is more than what's needed. So the body decides to organize the nutrients that it's got inside in storage places. Now, that story, the common storage place is the liver to start with. And once the liver is maxed out, the body starts to uh, organize some of the foods or the carbohydrates, the sugars that we're focusing on uh, into fat. And that's how the body builds up fat around. So fat is essentially you've got excess storage and that's, and, and that's been organized by the insulin. So this insulin hormone is a very important uh, hormone when it comes to organizing food in our body that we will see more and more of uh, throughout this presentation. Now let's take the other side of the story, the fasting state, uh, whereby your body is fasting, it hasn't had many nutrients for a while. Uh, uh, so the glucose is low essentially in that situation. Uh, 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 and the insulin is obviously slightly lower and your body's breaking down fat in that situation. So to start with, it breaks down the stores in the liver. And if you fast long enough, uh, it will break down the store. Eventually fat starts to be broken down. So this is what happens in the fasting state, essentially. So these are, these are the two sides of the coin. Now, what we found uh, from a, a medical perspective is, uh, moving on to the next. So what we found essentially is, uh, if you spend your, your time or your life more in the feeding state, so you eat too much in brief, mm -hmm. and uh, you, 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 over time, what happens is the insulin in your body is not working as well. There's more fat uh, that the insulin has to work on uh, to try and organize things. And we found that there is a concept called insulin resistance, whereby uh, the insulin is not working very well in the body. Now, when the insulin is not working very well in the body, uh, there's more sugar going around in the blood and that sugar is not coming down. So you can see where diabetes comes in. So when your insulin is not doing a good job, the sugar in the blood is higher than it needs to be. The body is not breaking it down. The body is not storing it away. And so you're more in a diabetic state. 
Now, this insulin uh, that's not working very well causes other problems around the body. So it causes problems to the heart, we know. Uh, it causes several problems, you know, even to the kidneys. Several organs are impacted uh, by a state of essentially insulin resistance, we call it. And that's in situations where we're excessively eating too much, number one. The other situation where insulin resistance, insulin not working properly is when we don't exercise much as well. Because we know that exercise is a big component in making sure that that insulin works well. So in essence, you know, God uh, has given us an opportunity when it comes to fasting to try and maybe regulate that situation better. And we know that when we're taking in less, when we're in the fasting state, what happens is the insulin is, is more effective, essentially. You're, you're taking in less. Uh, overall, the calories for that particular day is less. And, and so the insulin is more effective. And generally, there's less uh, damage, essentially, going on around the body. Um, so this is a good summary slide of what we've sort of discussed in a way with regards to, you know, insulin resistance and some of the benefits of fasting that we're coming on to. So number one, we said that the insulin is better and that's better for your body because the sugars are broken down better. So less likely to be diabetic, but there's also less overall inflammation we know in the body when it comes to fasting. Um, and inflammation, essentially, when something is inflamed and sore, uh, we know is bad sometimes inside the body. When there's a lot of inflammation going on, it's bad for the blood vessels uh, and it causes us uh, health problems. Uh, the other benefit of fasting we found out is uh, it reduces the cholesterol in the body. So giving your body that break from eating actually break, you know, reduces the cholesterol. Um, and, and the other, and there is some evidence to suggest that memory is better. And uh, studies that have been done in mice show that uh, people that are uh, mice that are fasted essentially have more protection inside the brain. And there is uh, some evidence to suggest maybe uh, fasting can help reduce the risk of conditions like dementia, Alzheimer's, where, where memory loss is an issue. So there's a lot of benefits that have come out over the last few years, showing the massive uh, benefit of fasting. And fasting, if you think about it, is probably a little bit easier than uh, some of the diets that we try to give to patients to tell you to cut out this and not cut out that. If we actually install a bit more fasting for some people, that might be much easier than uh, avoiding this but not taking this, uh, where in essence you can eat a bit, bit more better on certain days and other days you could be fasting. So there's a lot of research going on looking at diet from that perspective. Um, so I, ho I hope that's clear with regards to the, the, the benefits of fasting you can see on the slide. The other thing that's, uh, that, that fasting helps us with, uh, God, God also tells us in the Quran, you know, So you may have taqwa, you may have uh, God consciousness. God says that uh, fasting has been prescribed for you as a, as a medicine, God's prescribing it. So you may have consciousness, you may be aware of God. Uh, so all that includes an element of self-discipline as well. And so fasting gives us an opportunity to, to, to regulate ourselves and have better control. So habits like smoking, and you, you must know uh, people that do smoke, uh, stop, of course, during the time of fasting uh, in Ramadan, and they're able to stop for quite long periods. And that's, that's great in a way, a lot of willpower, a lot of control. So fasting gives us an opportunity to reflect and think, hang on a second, some of these harmful things, we might have a bit more self-control to try and help with these things, along with other strategies, of course, uh, with regards to that. Obesity. People who are, you know, people who normally tell you, you know what, I, c I can't stop eating, you know, I, I, it's really hard for me to lose the weight, it's really hard for me. They do really well in Ramadan, a lot of Muslims, mashallah, they're able to spend a lot of hours during the day uh, as, a, as an answer to God, of course, uh, uh, and, 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 and being devoted to God, they're able to spend lots of hours during the day not, not eating anything at all, let alone cutting out this or that. They don't eat anything at all. So again, fasting is an opportunity to, again, reflect uh, 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 and build that self-control up 
and have some goals for after Ramadan with regards to how we approach uh, our, our food. Um, so in Ramadan now, I wanted to go specifically into fasting and Ramadan. We completely change our eating habits in Ramadan and we have two meals essentially, one iftar and one suhoor. So I've told you a lot of benefits of fasting. You might turn around and say to me, well, look, Mahmoud, uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of Ramadan, I actually put on more weight than, I, than, I, than, I, than the beginning of Ramadan. I've put on more weight or, um, you know, I, the, the benefits might not be that great for some people. And the reason for this is that you need to do it properly from a health perspective. So if you're, for example, fasting the whole day, and then when it comes to iftar time, you're, you're grabbing that cake. Uh, if you eat your zigni or injera, you're, you're, you're eating all those oils and zigni nonstop. And then those greasy samosas, you're putting down your body and you're, you're eating 10 of the sweetest dates you can find. So suddenly you've eaten for two days worth of food within a few hours. So this, of course, uh, situation is not beneficial in terms of a health perspective uh, 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 with regards to fasting, because what your body's done is done a really good job of you, you know, improving. We said the way the insulin is working. You've given it a break. Uh, we we know that even the gut cleans itself out. There is a there is a, a, a physiological process called the migrating motor complex, where the gut cleans the food out of the gut. But that only happens after a certain amount of hours of fasting. So all of these nice things have been happening inside your body. Your body's trying to improve. And all of a sudden, what do you do? When you're, when you're eating recklessly, you throw all the sugars at it. So suddenly there's a huge swing in the blood sugar levels. So your, your, your insulin is overwhelmed. Your body is overwhelmed by the amount of sugar that you've thrown at it. This becomes actually harmful to the body. And, and, and so there's a potential for Muslims when it comes to fasting. I wrote there, we have two big swings in our blood glucose levels. So there's a potential that, that the body is essentially hit by two massive swings of sugar, which aren't very good in a way. So what we're doing in a way is we're not really helping the benefits that we've set ourselves up with throughout the day. So what I want to discuss with you, inshallah, is how you can actually continue that benefit even when you break your fast and you eat the food, so it complements the good work you did. Because if you ended up, do, you know, uh, eating, you know, every, two days worth of food, as I said, it's not very helpful. Um, so I want to. So the question that we always get asked is, okay, fine, what shall I eat then, doctor? And doctor always tells you to exercise, and doctor always tells you to make sure you have a good diet. But but what is a good diet? What shall I eat? This is a, a quite a common uh, picture that you may have seen before. You may have even seen it in your in your doctor's GP surgery on a poster, uh, and it and it all looks a jumble and it might all look a bit uh, confusing. But essentially, I want you to take away a key message uh, from it with regards to how we should approach what type of foods we're having. So again, that question: what what diet shall I have? What what's the best thing shall I eat, doctor? There is no magic answer. There is no answer that tells you uh, um, this is what you should eat and you'll be perfect. If you have a low carb diet, you're perfect. If you have a high fat diet, but you cut this out, you're perfect. It doesn't exist in essence. Your body, Allah has created it, essentially needing a lot of things in balance for it to function really well. There is definitely foods that you should avoid. So there are definitely do not do's and there, and there are other things that you, you should do in certain proportions. So you can see at the top of, of the pyramid over here, you can see we have crisps, we have Coca-Cola, we have chocolates, we have cakes, we have biscuits, all the stuff we love uh, to, to indulge with in essence. Um, what, what is the recommended allowance uh, for this type of food? from a medical perspective in essence that there is no recommended allowance because this food is not really part of a healthy diet so there is no recommended allowance but what we would say is it shouldn't be done every day so you should try your best to have a day that's off when it comes to some of these cakes and all of the sweet things that you enjoy 
and if you're doing it every single day, then this particular Ramadan, what I propose to you is this type of food alternate. So one, uh, I, you know, one day you may have it, the next day you won't. If you can't stop, then I would I would recommend that you try and alternate at least, where you're giving yourself a break of these types of food. And you certainly shouldn't be eating huge amounts of these types of foods after a long day of fasting to suddenly hammer your body with all these sugars. It's not very good. The next, the next uh, bit in the pyramid that we're looking at over here is fats, uh, oils, these sorts of things. And the recommendation for this is in very small amounts. So you can see with the pyramid here, it's really small at the top and it gets bigger and bigger as you go down. There's very good reason for that. That means that the amount of food that you should be eating more of is further down. So these, the, the bottom of the, of, of, the, of, of the pyramid should be more of what your diet is about. So if your diet is split the other way around, so the top bit is actually the bigger bit in the pyramid for you. So chocolates, cakes, crisps, or coke, this is a sign that you're in trouble and, uh, and should be doing something about it. And, and seeking help in that regard. So going down, uh, so the smallest bit is this horrible foods at the top, and then going down the fats, the oils, we say small amounts in that regard. And then going down when it comes to uh, meat, uh, chicken, fish, eggs, beans, and nuts, this we, we say two servings a day. And what we mean by two servings is using your palm, that's one serving of food, so two servings of these, essentially, that's the quantity that you should be having in a, in a typical day. Obviously, when you're fasting in Ramadan, you might not be able to achieve you know, everything that you should be having in a typical day. And I think that's a good thing for the majority of us. We actually need a bit less calories for a while to, to help detox our body. And then further down, uh, we've got uh, milk, yogurt uh, and cheese. Uh, and, uh, and, and these sorts of things we're talking about around three servings a day. Now, obviously, milk and yogurts you don't have with, with you can't use your palm. So for that, we use uh, one serving of cheese is essentially two thumbs. You can see on the poster and the, the milk and, uh, and the cereal. Uh, sorry, the cereal is further down. Uh, so uh, the. the some like 200 mils would be the milk is, is one serving. So you might have one of each, so a bit of cheese, some milk, 200 mils and some yogurt. So three servings essentially of these things. Then we go further down. This is a bit more what our diet is actually uh, sort of based on in a way. Uh, we've got the carbohydrates. Now, sugars actually fall into a category, big group called carbohydrates. And there are different types of, uh, of carbohydrates uh, some of them, like, like the sugars, like you have in your fizzy drinks and your cake and your chocolate, they're called simple sugars and generally they're not very good for you. These types of carbohydrates are called more complex carbohydrates. These are much better for you. So potatoes, uh, brown bread, anything that's whole grain, essentially, the Weetabix over there. Um, what, what this means is, you know, when you have the reason why we love sugar so much is if we have a fizzy drink, it's quick, it hits the bloodstream really quick, we feel excited really quick, it hits our brain really quick, it makes us feel happier quicker. Now with the complex carbohydrates, or what I call the slow release, or what is called the slow release carbohydrates, like the brown bread, like the uh, um, the, the, your, your Weetabix, all of those sorts of things, your rice, these things actually hit the bloodstream slowly. So they're better, they're much better than the sugars. So having these foods and work with rice as well, try and not eat too much white rice, more brown rice. So things that are more whole grain, more natural and not really ref, uh, refined and changed um, are, are much better. So brown bread versus white bread, white bread is a bit more refined, more, more sugars in that regard, brown bread, a lot better, more, more natural. And that, that releases in your body a slow source of energy that happens over a period of time. And when it comes to fasting, as we will discuss shortly, these are the ones that are actually a lot better and more useful to our body. So, and then the, at the bottom of the, of, the, of, the, of the pyramid, essentially, you've got all the fruits and vegetables there, and they should try and occupy a lot more of what we should be eating and drinking.
So, okay, let's focus. So now the question even more uh, focused is, what, what, what shall I eat? So I would recommend for your iftar to start off maybe with two or three dates. Don't overdo it with the dates as well, because alhamdulillah, they're good for you. You know, this, uh, of course, there's sunnah in that regard. You've been fasting the whole day. If you eat 10, 20 dates, that's a lot of sugar straight away. So two or three dates to break your fast. Uh, at that point, you can decide to have uh, uh, some water and um, and and do your salah. Um, in terms of the rest of your iftar meal, uh, pasta is better than, for example, white rice. The pasta is more whole grain. It's slower release energy. So your body is not overwhelmed with all the insulin. It's not overwhelming the body. So that is better for you as, as, a, as a more complex energy source in a way. Uh, and we say grilled food versus fried food. So lots of these greasy oils, they're going to put more fat in your body. They're going to give you bad cholesterol. So we say where possible, you have to reduce the oil. Samosas, if possible, bake them in the oven. If not possible, um, you know, uh, fry them with very shallow oil. Avoid deep frying, lots of oil, all that grease. And where possible, use olive oil compared to sunflower oil. And if you want to treat you eat fresh fruits, mangoes, you know, su sweeter fruits, if you like, watermelons, not excessively, of course, compared to sugary sweets. This is what we would recommend to try and uh, move towards, in essence, when it comes to iftar. Mm -hmm. Similar thing when it comes to suhoor as well. Um, again, uh, having uh, 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 porridge slow release energy will, will stay in your body longer, will make you feel like you have energy for longer. Uh, so uh, the porridge, the Weetabix, the, these types of foods, uh, the fruits and vegetables, again, compared to sweet foods, uh, you can obviously have some brown bread. Again, that will give you slow energy for the rest of the day because you're about to start your, your, your fast in essence. So this should be more your focus. Okay, so that's food in summary. And the, the message that I want to get across in terms of fasting and Ramadan essentially is that, um, if you just give me one second, I apologize. Okay, so essentially the message that I want to get across to all of you, inshallah, is that we can make the fast beneficial, the benefit of having, you know, all of those things, you know, reduced uh, insulin resistance, so less heart problems, uh, less problems related to sugar problems, diabetes, all the health benefits that we can get from the fast is, 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 is there if we eat properly during the time that we're not fasting. So this is the key thing that I want to get across from a health perspective. And you don't need to change everything. This might seem overwhelming for you. If you don't have fruits and vegetables in your diet normally during iftar time, I suggest you do. If, you, if you're constantly frying things on oil, if you can change that, change that. Pick two or three things that you can focus on and that are going to make a big difference because this is the way you're going to eat for the next uh, certain amount of days. And as I said, a, a good diet is essentially a balanced diet. So if you look at these categories and you think, Wallah, Mahmoud, I don't eat any of this or I don't eat any of this, then you know that you're missing out essentially. If your diet is very focused up here and there's not much in the other categories, then you need to worry because the other categories should be more of the diet and, and, the, and these treats should be much less of the diet. Okay, I hope that message is clear. Now, moving forward, I thought of talking about common problems uh, very briefly uh, before I open up to questions that people have uh, during Ramadan, because these are typical questions that my patients will, will call me about and Muslims will call me about to discuss. So I thought it would be a nice idea just to talk about them. Number one is heartburn. What we mean by heartburn is acidity. You know, when you get all that acid in your, in your, in your throat, when you're trying to sleep before suhoor, maybe you're feeling acidic, it's all not very nice in your tummy. Uh, that's partially because of the, the foods that we're putting inside. So we have to look and see, are we having a lot of oily food during iftar? Are we having a lot of spicy food? Are we eating too much? So if we're eating too much all at once, again, that's bad for the body, but at the same time, the stomach doesn't like it. That's why it's not going down as well. And it's causing us all of this heart heartburn. The other thing is we like our boon, we like our coffee. 
If you have too much boon, what does that do on an empty stomach? It's not very good, is it? It ends up irritating the stomach, causing burning, acidity, causing problems in that regard. So you need to try and maybe weaken that boon, maybe mix it with a little bit of milk or, or take less, less, less coffee during the fasting time. Again, that will reduce your heartburn and all of those sorts of things. Um, so a, a good possible, and if you need any medication, things like Gaviscon, or speak to your local pharmacist. They might be able to give you tablets uh, like Nexium. Those, there is medication out there that can help if you have a lot of heartburn, uh, you know, uh, even while you're trying to correct your diet or if your diet's correct, but you're having lots of heartburn, please speak to your pharmacist who should be qualified enough to help, help you. And you might not even need to speak to a doctor. Second thing is headaches. Headaches and migraines are very common. I'm sure a lot of you experience this. Again, it's it's part of things that can help with regards to this is number one, drinking lots of water. We know being dehydrated is not very good. And the, the, if you're going to binge on something, if you're going to take lots of something, I would say it should be the water. But don't try and do it all at suhoor time. All you're going to do is, is have a big bladder and, and be passing lots of water in, in that regard, which is fine, but if you can try and start your water intake at a good amount all the way from iftar and have lots of water throughout the process again it gives your body the opportunity to absorb all of that water and that water will mean that you're better hydrated for the next day of fasting and that might reduce the chances of you having a headache caffeine so people that have too much coffee uh, uh, of course you know during fasting time do struggle in future, maybe difficult this Ramadan, but in future, before Ramadan starts, maybe two months, try and slowly reduce the amount of coffee your body needs. Very slowly reduce the amount such that when it comes to Ramadan time, you don't need that much coffee. So you're going to have less headaches. And of course, if you if you suffer from headaches, then make sure you get some good uh, painkillers like ibuprofen is an example. And again, if you don't know if that's good for you or not, I think it's important that you speak to your local pharmacist. Again, can help you with this quite easily in that regard. And uh, having, again, having maybe some slow release carbohydrates. And what are slow release carbohydrates? These are the ones that we discussed already uh, at the more towards the bottom of the food chain where you've got more um, brown bread, uh, the porridge, the potatoes, uh, the pasta, all of these things are slow release carbohydrates. They're going to give you more energy throughout the day. So you're going to have less low sugars, less headaches, hopefully. So have a good porridge for suhoor. That might help reduce the amount of headaches you get as well in that regard. Dehydration is a common phenomenon when it comes to, uh, 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 not a common phenomenon, when it comes to fasting, it's a possibility. So again, make sure you get lots of water in during that time and get it over a long period of time, rather all at once at suhoor time. If you have water tablets like diuretics, for example, vendroflumathiazide, fruzamide, all of these types of tablets, I suggest you speak to your doctor because these types of tablets will dehydrate you a little bit more uh, and may, may put you at risk of dehydration. Of course, if you feel really lightheaded, dizzy, not quite right, then please also take action and it may mean that you definitely you know, need to break your fast in essence. So if you're feeling dizzy, you're not feeling quite right, you're, sh you're shaking, all of those sorts of things, it means you need to get some water or some sugar into your body. And Allah has given us that concession, alhamdulillah, from his mercy. And we can make up the fast at a later date. God doesn't want us to damage our body with fasting. This is a very important uh, point that I need you to take away. Um, I have lots of examples and lots of stories of people that have done all sorts of things that are wrong by fasting and damaging their body. And that, in essence, is, of course, sinful. They're not getting reward. They're damaging their body. God doesn't want this. So if you feel dehydrated, uh, dizzy, not quite right. Another situation is hypoglycemia. It's uncommon in healthy people, but you might feel shaking, sweating, craving like you need some sugar inside your body in that situation you you must 
act on those feelings and you may need to break your fast and you must break your fast. Otherwise, it will be dangerous for your health, especially in people who are sort of diabetics that are really well controlled and normally fast and don't need, for example, insulin and normally are fasting well. In those situations, the, if you start to get sweaty, you start to feel you know, dizzy, not quite orientated well, uh, you start to breathe a bit more. Those are all signs that you need to get some sugar in your body quickly. Uh, it could be you know, sugary orange juice, Lucozade. And when you have your, the, the sugars in, also have some biscuits or a sandwich because that will slowly release more sugars into your body. And inshallah, you can reflect on how you are fasting in this situation and you can either make that up, or if your body is not able to make that up at any point, then God again has given you another concession to feed people who, who, who pay for people who, you know, to feed them, inshallah, poor people. So there's a lot of uh, concessions in that regard. Weight control. I think we discussed this already. And we said that if you suddenly eat two days worth of food within a few hours, you're going to have weight problems. Your body's being overwhelmed. The insulin's not working as well. It's not breaking things up and so forth in that regard. So I think this talk has covered this in, the, in that regard. Um, I think at this stage, I will summarize and I'll open the floor to questions, inshallah, because I'm conscious of time as well. And I have overrun a little bit. So going back to my original questions probably is useful to summarize. Uh, so I said, number one, what happens to your body when you're fasting? And we talked about the way insulin, it's that really important hormone that helps break down things. There are other hormones as well, but we focused on one of them that's important. And we said that a lot of positive things happen inside the body when you're fasting uh, in terms of health benefits. And we said, can fasting harm you from a health perspective? I said, potentially, if you're binging and you're eating horrible foods, then it's not very good. And I gave you examples of ways you can try and eat more healthier, more slowly, smaller portions over a longer period of time, lots of water over a longer period of time, that's much healthier. And, and finally, I also said that Ramadan is a really good opportunity for us to reflect as Muslims, uh, to be more controlled, more disciplined, and inshallah can deal with things, that, things like smoking, uh, whether it's tobacco or even shisha, because people think shisha is okay, it's not as good or bad as smoking. Shisha is bad for you as well, believe it or not. Um, uh, and all of these unhealthy things that we do. I don't think people in our community chew tobacco much, but again, this is another problem and an opportunity in Ramadan to, 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 to reflect and take this opportunity to try and improve. And if you wanna stop smoking, there is a lot of help out there. All you need to do is speak to your GP surgery. They have stop smoking services and they can help you throughout that process if you, if, if you wanna do it. I hope that's clear, inshallah, in that regard. So I'll open up the floor to questions and we'll take it from there. Jazakum uh, khairan. I'll stop sharing my screen. Assalamu alaikum. Alaik salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mahmoud, for um, the discussion. It was very enlightening. Um, I've got some questions that are in the comments section. Are you happy for me to go through them? Yeah, I think it's better we focus on people's questions. So let's let's jump straight in and see what we can do. Yeah. So um, one of them was asking, can you um, would you recommend a specific food program for Ramadan that you would follow uh, to have a better diet? And I think you were. Uh, discussing that uh you know what things to replace in your diet but is there i i have asked for the question to be a bit more clarified That's but right. uh, i wonder if it's uh, talking about you know keto diets and this diet and that type of diet is there any specific recommended uh, diet program okay so for fast uh, there there are uh for I'm, I'm assuming the question specifically focused at ramadan and fasting so i, I would tackle it from that yeah. I would recommend, again, as I said before, open your fast with two or three dates and then have a look at that pyramid. So um, I think it's, uh, let me try and find it for you. Uh, online, you'll be able to, if you just Google the food pyramid, you'll be able to see what is a, a balanced diet in essence. So if you start with two or three dates, uh, if you decide that you're gonna pick maybe a fish portion, 
and instead of as i said the the more have complex carbohydrates so brown bread or you know pasta with your food in essence something along those lines uh would be a healthy start and if you look at the pyramid you'll be able to take different aspects of the pyramid so at least you have something in each box so if you google food pyramid you'll be able to have something in each box at the right quantity and pick one thing at the right quantity and inshallah take it from that angle key thing is cut out all of those greasy stuff i would say as much as possible as well in that regard and have lots of water i i i i'm sorry if it's a very generic answer but there is no uh, I, i would say magic diets in that regard but the key thing is just the quantity number 1 and having a balanced diet look at the food pyramid to show which foods you should be having more of and which foods you should be having less of if you keep the quantities lower than you know in, in essence than what normally people unfortunately because they've been fasting eat lots you, you will automatically okay. lose weight <laughs> if you want to lose weight you're going to lose weight just by eating less during that time yeah okay fantastic So the next question I have is um my relative uh uses an inhaler uh for asthma will that break their fast Okay it depends this is this is uh, this is this a question that you might need to uh, present to someone who's a scholar of course a sheikh there are different opinions I'm going to be honest with you from the start one opinion that i've been taught is it depends on the type of inhaler you have so if it's like the blue puffer the aerosol for example inhalers then they say that that is fine and it doesn't break the fast at all so i wouldn't worry about those type of aerosol inhalers they're like the gas ones some okay. say yeah so the gas inhalers generally any puffy gas ones they're fine they don't break because a lot of them go straight into the lungs now there is an opinion that other types of inhalers like the powder inhalers these get into the stomach so th- there are two there are a few ways to break your fast but one way is something touching the stomach and another common way is is it nutritional or not is the other question that scholars have so some say that the powdered inhaler uh can potentially break your fast the powdered inhaler is usually what we call a preventer so these are inhalers that prevent uh you uh needing lots of the the gas inhalers essentially and these we normally only use twice a day so you might be able to have good control by using your inhaler twice once during iftar time and once during suhoor time especially if your asthma is stable from the powder inhaler perspective and that might give you uh, you know that might get you out of that dilemma of does it break the fast or not uh, the key thing is obviously to stay healthy and make sure you don't do anything dangerous because asthma is potentially dangerous if it's not well controlled and uh, and get some advice from your gp regarding your specific medication and also an an imam that you trust in that regard but i hope i've given you at least an opinion so the gas generally everyone's happy with doesn't really break your fast during the day the powder there there is a difference of opinion in that regard and some say that breaks the fast when it hits uh the stomach in that regard okay that's really helpful thank you so much for the distinction as well it's interesting um the next question uh, i'm seeing in the box is um is there um particular levels or types of exercise um you would recommend while fasting okay this is a good question i would say uh simply because uh exerting remember where you're at in terms of fasting towards iftar time your body has been really sort of depleted your energy levels all of us are a bit more down in that regard and some people may exercise very rigorously during that period that can sometimes be harmful because your body's already really down and suddenly you you exercise really lots in that regard so i would say when you're fasting try and not exercise too strenuously overall and build yourself up this is key so don't sort of decide today you know what i, I want to be more healthy i'm going to exercise and fast and suddenly you're doing circuit training or you're pushing lots of weights and you're running around you're going to drop So I would say start off maybe by going for a walk if that's not something you're used to doing while you're fasting. So maybe a 20 minute walk, go for that. 
and and then after that build up to more rigorous walk so walk really fast to, to the last maybe five ten minutes of your walk make sure you walk really fast such that you're panting when you get to your house <sighs> you're doing a bit of that then that means that the walk essentially is is a bit more rigorous and then you can slowly build yourself up if you can tolerate a bit more uh, uh, exercise at home then then you can do a bit more in that regard but you have to be careful that it's not too strenuous to the point that you feel really dizzy uh, and it's not all of a sudden like the the, the hit workouts so to speak that are really intense all at, all at once uh, can be quite da damaging the other option is actually maybe maybe flipping my argument a little bit, going backwards a bit, but maybe the last 10, 15 minutes or 20 minutes, if you're not making, you, you make some dua, of course, but you might do some exercise and you're going to break your fast soon after that. Then you can do a bit during that time as well, safely that you know that, you know, you, you're going to have some food and water soon. But don't be too rigorous is the key, is the key answer. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, thank you very much. The next question is, if you have a temperature, uh, should you wait until Maghrib to take medication? Uh, and I assume that he means take medication to manage the temperature. This is a good question, uh, but I think it's, it's, a very, it's a very general question. Uh, and it would need to be tailored specifically to an individual. So by temperature, I take it we mean like a fever, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that you're having, if you're feeling feverish um, and not quite right, then um, I think you should get some help with regards to that, if possible, some medical advice that's tailored uh, specifically to you in that regard um, and, and how you're feeling in that situation. But if you're feeling really run down, you're deteriorating, then definitely you should uh, break your fast. If, if you feel you can tolerate it and, it and it's maybe a slight temperature, you've got one hour left till Maghrib or something, then, then it, the situation might differ. And if it's a young, healthy person and there's not many uh, problems at all, if it's a more older person, the situation will differ. So it's very hard for me to give a, a blanket answer that might cause problems to other people that are listening and, and take take it the wrong way in that regard. So I would say uh, get some advice from your doctor or one 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 you can call or your or your or your G, sorry your GP you could ask at, at a later point. Don't 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 call one 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 just just for that. Um, if in oh. doubt, obviously you know look up, look after yourself because it's a very busy time at the moment. Calling one one one, you'll be on the phone until the last time. <laughs> <laughs> then you can take it. You can so then you won't have a problem. You can just break your fast. <laughs> I've start time. Uh, no, thank you so much. I think that one of the takeaways from that is um, if you if you feel that you are becoming unwell, that you seek help. Uh, would that be the case? Because sometimes um, I'm not sure about your experience, but some people can be quite unwell, but don't want to break the fast thinking that they can sol sol soldier through it. Can that be more damaging? Yeah, the principle is if you, um, from an Islamic perspective, the principle is basically, my understanding is if you're unwell such that the fasting starts to harm you, in essence, to make that illness worse or delays recovery of that illness, then you're allowed to break your fast. That's the that's the the the, the principle overall. So, if delaying breaking your fast is going to make you worse, or it's going to delay your recovery, then you're allowed to break your fast. But it really depends on the individual and how they're feeling. Is it just a mild snuffle? You know, we, we call things temperature as well. But when you measure people's temperature, the temperature is normal. Maybe they have a slight. Mm -hmm and they're 20 years old and they feel fine and they're at home and they're not doing too much and they've got one or two hours, they can tolerate it, no problem. If they're getting worse, obviously they can break their fast. For someone older who's coughing a lot, has fevers, then, or, or even younger coughing a lot with fevers, especially during this uh, COVID time, then we'd say, you know, be very sensible in that regard and, and you have to be careful uh, not damaging your body. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Um, there are a lot of people with um, <clears throat> chronic health conditions. One of the most common ones in our community is diabetes. Um, and they are on medication. So they might have blood pressure medication. They might have diabetic medication, which can vary from being tablets all the way up to being injections of insulin. Um, they might have mental health issues where they're taking medication in the morning or nighttime. Um, 
how how should these people approach uh, the fasting and what they do with the medication? So it's, again, that's a tough question, but a very good question. In terms of a general approach to this, is that can your medication be structured in such a way that it can be, you know, changed to the times uh, between iftar and suhoor? So that's the first question you ask yourself. Can, can your medication do that? And in, and in order for you to answer that question, you probably need to speak to your GP again. Uh, you can have a phone appointment with to discuss, can your medication uh, schedule be changed? without causing yourself damage and harm and making you feel unwell in that regard. So if the answer to that is yes, that your medication can be managed in such a way that it can be structured at a slightly different time, and generally speaking, you're not really gonna be much worse uh, for, for the month, then inshallah that's positive uh, from, a, from, from being able to fast perspective. I would say if, uh, so with diabetics, again, the question is control, and the type of medication they have. If you're on medication like, for example, a glycolazide, people will, 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 may, may be on this type of tablet. Um, this particular tablet can cause your sugar levels to come down quite low, and that could be unsafe uh, for, for particular individuals. So we need to tailor the answer to them specifically and what type of tablets they have, not just insulin and tablets, but what type of tablets do you have and how is your control? If your diabetes is very poorly controlled, you have had situations in the past where you've had sudden drop in sugar and you felt very sort of dizzy and not quite right and you needed sugar because of a very low sugar, then if you've had those scenarios, then you yourself are, are, are more of a, at risk, sort of a higher risk diabetic person, if that hasn't all been controlled and brought down at a good manageable level. So it depends on what type of control that diabetics have uh, and what type of medication they have. Of course, if you have insulin, that makes it even more difficult. And generally the advice for diabetics with insulin is they should be avoiding fasting uh, in a sense, especially the type one uh, diabetics. But as I said, it depends on the individual and inshallah, you can get a tailored answer. People who are checking their blood sugars or are able to check their blood sugars uh, and are diabetics, then this is also a good, good thing to do. If you're very well controlled diabetic, your tablets can be managed during iftar, suhoor time. You don't have very low crashes in sugar. Then you can get a monitoring machine just to keep an eye on your sugar and make sure you know what numbers are good and what numbers are bad. Uh, so, so you can also monitor yourself in that regard and be able to fast healthily. So it depends on the individual. Uh, so the, the, there's no one size fits all or one answer fits all. So I recommend inshallah that you have a chat with your GP and book a phone appointment. Okay, that's really helpful. So uh, I think one of the takeaways as well that you mentioned is that your, your GP, your own doctor knows your severity of your medical condition they know what type of medication you're on um, and they understand can you know do you have to be on this all throughout the day or can it be structured you know after iftar before so um that's very helpful because sometimes i've uh, you know personally you know experienced that some people don't talk to the doctors and they um we find that they've just stopped their medication or uh, they've changed the dose or they've halved the dose without any advice from the doctors and um, we find that they can become quite unwell which is quite risky for their health um, and going back to I guess to the point you made about the principle that if this is going to make your health condition worse then actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not wish for you to cause harm and actually it's more detrimental thank you so much for that um, on things that nullify fast um you we talked about inhalers and whether they did there were some other things regarding uh, medical uh, procedures um do does taking blood test um nullify the fast yeah again i think there is a difference of opinion when it comes to bleeding but generally no uh from the, the opinion that i follow that uh, you know and, the, and there are lots of narrations where um, for example, I believe the Sahaba even did, uh, there's a hadith on hijama being done during the fasting time and so forth. So uh, blood is in essence, uh, uh, taking blood, the, the short answer is inshallah, you should be fine uh, in that regard. But I'm conscious there are differences of opinion. 
and maybe ask a scholar you you're you're more comfortable with in that regard who's far more qualified than me as well to if 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 you want an answer that's tailored to you but you should be fine from the opinion that i follow the other Thank thing I say, uh, is that because i i felt it we're sort of you know um, with regards to the medication and people that are not not able to fast but push themselves and you know it can be sinful as, as you said it can be detrimental uh, Kamal you mentioned I think it's important for these people to also uh, be that aren't able to fast to recognize that fasting is an ibadah at the end of the day it's an act of worship and you're doing it for the pleasure of God and God has given you uh, um, guidelines by which you should fast so we, sh we shouldn't also see Ramadan as just fasting. We should be engaging in other ways of ibadah. If fasting is a struggle, Allah knows our situation. That's why he's told us to do particular things that he'll be more happy with rather than fasting in that regard. But we can also do other, other acts of worship and just you know stay positive in that regard. So either way, inshallah, you'll get, you'll get the reward for your intention as well if you're not fasting. Thank you so much for that. Um, th there was one other question about uh, what, what I had. Um, if you have a drip, for example, so you're not um, taking taking a feed in through your mouth, but you have um, something put into your veins, whether that's medication or nourishment, does that break the fast? Okay, that's a, that's, that's a good one as well. So um, with regards to injections or you know, things that go in the vein, for example, uh, whether it goes into the muscle or the vein, there is a general sort of principle in a way, in the sense that is this giving you nourishment? So if, you're, if you've got something in the vein, for example, as Kamal has asked, and there's a drip with fluids, then you are being nourished by fluids. You are being, uh, you know, and as such, that would break your fast, according to you know everyone i know that that would break your fast in that regard uh, with regards to uh, nourishment through the vein now if you are having something that is not a nourishment for example you're having i don't know you there might be a a vaccine inshallah against covid uh, 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 soon inshallah and, and everyone can go back to work and stuff so if you have an injection like that that's protecting you from a particular disease then that is not really a nourishment uh, so it's not a food uh, in a sense or, or, or a fluid. So that doesn't break your fast. OK, I hope that deals with it. So it's not really where it goes, but is it a nourishment in terms of injecting? You? That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, so just uh, the last comment that I would like to respond to. Somebody's asked about um, what you mentioned about heartburn. But my recommendation uh, would be that um, if they can replay the video because it will remain on the on the page, um, uh, that rather than you having to go through that all over again at this point, um, so there will be a recording which will remain on um, the Facebook page. Um, so that sort of uh, wraps up all of our questions. Um, I really appreciate your time, uh, Mahmoud. At this point, um, were there any sort of summary? points that you wanted to make and then at that point <clears throat> I would like to sort of introduce Abu Mu'ayya then we can sort of close today's discussion. Uh, just no just Jazakumullah khairan for the opportunity I would say you know um, great opportunity to be healthy during Ramadan if you need any advice that's medical again as, as Kamal you articulated your GP knows your records quite well so book a phone appointment is enough and same thing with a lot of the Islamic questions that I handled. Uh, I just want to say that I'm not an Islamic scholar. These are opinions that I follow, that I learned uh, from, from, from teachers in that regard. Ultimately, you know, God knows best with regards to these answers. And again, um, you, you can speak to a friendly imam and I'm sure Emka will be able to support you in that regard, uh, who, who are hosting this talk today, inshallah. If, um, I, I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it from all of us uh, and blesses us during this time oh. challenging in that regard. Jazakum Allah khairan. Very um, And, and uh, for me, I'd like to uh, appreciate uh, all the time that you've given us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jazakum Allah khair. Um, and uh,
I just recommend to all of those people who've come in at this point, uh, please do watch the video from the start. So you'll have an introduction to uh, the album that I've made and an introduction to our organization, Eritrea Health, and the whole presentation that uh, Dr. Mahmoud kindly did for us with a lot of interesting slides. Uh, so if you missed anything, um, please do replay this uh, and submit very interesting question and answers. Um, so um, that's it from me. I'd like to appreciate Emka as well for, uh, for hosting this. Uh, and I'd like to encourage everybody who's watching to really support Emka uh, in this difficult time with COVID, with the mosque that's closed. Um, I know funding for Masajid uh, is, is, um, is very difficult because nobody's coming, uh, but they still have their overheads uh, and their needs that we as a community should be supporting them with. So with that, I'd like to close and uh, give my salam. Salam alaikum wa wabarakatuh. And I'd like to hand over to Abu Mu'adh. Assalamu alaikum wa wabarakatuh. Um, Dr. Mahmoud, jazakallah khair. We enjoyed um, uh, your presentation. It was excellent. Um, and inshallah ta'ala, we uh, try to apply some of the uh, benefits, especially from the food uh, pyramids, uh, which I'm sure for some people is a little bit flipped, maybe. <laughs> but uh, it was it was good to jazakallah khair. Um, very short and also to the point. Um, uh, also, uh, Dr. Kamal, Jazakallah Khair for handing in the Q&A and um, also um, the whole session. Um, inshallah, the video will be uploaded on YouTube. So for those um, who missed it, they can inshallah ta'ala also watch it on YouTube. Um, uh, so we're going to put a link inshallah ta'ala to it. Um, we inshallah ta'ala have a few things coming in the next few days. Tomorrow we have um, a session. Uh, it's going to be about parenting with uh, Ustaz Ahmed al -Shiba. So for parents, uh, you have questions about um, children, difficulties, behavior, and so on. Inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow at 3 o'clock, um, you can inshallah ta'ala join our Zoom uh, live streaming. And you can ask questions and um, also learn from the from, uh, techniques and ways of dealing with uh, children's behaviors and so on. Uh, and on Thursday, we have uh, Sheikh Abu Hanifa at 11 p.m. And uh, he's going to be talking about interesting uh, topic, which is al-waqf al-islami. And we all know uh, about waqf and uh, al-awqaf. Uh, he's going to, inshallah ta'ala, talk about the histor historically um, side of, of al-waqf and uh, throughout our ummah history. Uh, very interesting, inshallah ta'ala. You can join us uh, on Thursday at 11 p.m. On Friday, inshallah ta'ala, the, the usual Jum'ah uh, reminder is going to be at 3 p.m. For this Friday, not 2 p.m. It's going to be 3 p.m. and it's going to be done by uh, Sheikh Musa Abu Zaghla. Uh, he was one of our imams in uh, Taraweeh in uh, Masjid Al Najashi. So it's going to be doing, inshallah, that uh, reminder. And on Saturday, inshallah ta'ala, is our live appeal. And I thank Dr. Kamal for reminding everyone to uh, support uh, MK and Najashi at, at this difficult time. On Saturday, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to have live appeal and we ask everyone, inshallah ta'ala, to be with us and support the masjid. As I said, we're trying to be on the ground, uh, giving help, and also try to build that communication and that link with the whole community through uh, making our um, live uh, Zoom um, events and uh, our Facebook um, account. Jazakumullah um, uh, khair. Thank you very much. We uh, enjoyed it. Um, do you have anything uh, to, to, to say, uh, Dr. Kamal? I think it's, it's, I'm, I'm done for my side. Uh, no, that's it. I've, I've closed. Barakallah uh, Fikum. Okay. Jazakum Allah khair all for watching and uh, thank you very much. Barakallah Fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.